Um, as Lou said, I'm, I, we work with horses. I run a market garden at Chagford, um, just on the northeast edge of Dartmoor, um, which we run as a community sports agriculture scheme on about six acres of land. Um, and we've been going about, we're just going into our fourth year this year. Um, and since we've started, we've been doing the majority of our work, cultivation and tillage, with working horses. So that's what I'm going to talk to you about tonight, working with horses, in, specifically in market gardens. Um, but to begin with, I'm just going to give you a bit of brief history on working horses in the UK for people who aren't familiar with kind of where it all started. So we've actually been working with horses in this country since our earliest breeds were domesticated about 3,000 years ago. So that's when there was small, um, most of the ponies around that time looked like the Dartmoor ponies really. They were kind of very small, stocky breeds um, up on the highlands, kind of roaming free. And those were gradually domesticated um, as agriculture became mechanised sort of in, yeah, early, about, about three, three, two to 3,000 years ago. Um, but it wasn't really until we developed this, the rigid head collar, which on this nice woodcut here, this is actually incidentally a um, woodcut by an artist called um, George Soper, if anyone knows him. He's a fantastic artist who does, um, he's actually, he died in the 60s, but in the 20s he spent a lot of time in East Anglia um, documenting working horses. Um, he's got a couple of books that have got fantastic woodcuts and lino drawings of um, working horses. But it kind of demonstrates the, um, the rigid head collar here which kind of revolutionised working, um, using working horses in the UK. Prior to that, we were trying to, well, all over the world as well, we were trying to use um, a yoke um, to work with horses, so similar to how you'd work an oxen, which is just a big lump of um, oak really across the, t the top of the oxen's neck, or ash it probably would have been. Um, but the problem with that is that um, horses and oxen are developed very differently um, physiologically. So um, the horse would actually tend to choke when you're trying to use a, a, um, a yoke with it, which wasn't, didn't make for effective horsemanship. Um, but what's fantastic about the collar is it really maximises the skeletal structure of the horse and it uses the, the collarbone. It kind of sits aligned on top of the collarbone um, and converts very efficiently, converts the pushing power of the horse into a pulling power on the trace to pull whatever implement. Say again? Sorry, yeah, it's leather. The, um, yeah, the collar itself is leather, um, but it's um, made more rigid by a, a set of metal um, frames that are called a hame that goes a hame that join around the outside. So that was really the, t the turning point in the seven, 700, eight, around 700, that we invented the, the rigid head collar. And that m meant that then there was kind of a flurry of innovation and design in horse-drawn technology. Um, so we've had now over a millennia of um, kind of, let's say, innovation and trying new things, things that didn't work, and kind of natural progression in, in horse tools. And we've evolved from simple pony plows. The earliest plows were simply just um, bits of wood with a stone attached to it, which um, paired off the top of the soil. Um, and today we kind of evolved to the point where we've got land-driven combine harvesters um, and mowers, <coughs> and, and I've even seen recently in, this, um, in the Small Farmers Journal, this uh, magazine from the States, if anyone's interested in horses, I thoroughly recommend a, a read of it. Um, <coughs> you can get a um, land-driven front loader for horses, that the horses actually push forward and it can, it's used for building haystacks, so you can lift up hay up to kind of 20 or 30 foot in height. So we have progressed quite a long way over the past millennium in terms of horsepower and horse technology. Um, the peak of the, the draft era in the UK really came in about the mid-19th century, um, just before the agricultural revolution, obviously, really, uh, when there was about half a million horses working on farms in the country. Um, but the, by the turn of the century, by the turn of last century, um, the larger farms really started experimenting with um, the earliest tractors and steam-powered plowing machines. Um, and that kind of um, led to a decline in the number of working horses. And by 1920, there was as few as about estimates, about 200,000 working horses. Um, I think the, the wars, both wars kind of took a toll on that as well. Um, today, um, there's about 20 people regularly working horses um, in commercial farming units in the UK. In terms of the horses that we've got, um, there's three um, main, we've got three native um, heavy horse breeds in the UK. Um, that, that native to this country. Um, the top, one on the top left here is probably one you'll, most of you will recognise most commonly. It's the, um, the Shire, um, and that comes from the eastern shires of the Midlands, so from Leicestershire, Lincolnshire, um, there's no one, Nottinghamshire, around that area. And they're distinctive really because they're, they're usually full black or full bay, um, a brown colour, um, and they usually have um, a number of white socks, either four white socks, two white socks, one white sock. These are called socks, by the flares at the bottom, um, and um, heavy feathering on the feet. And they also tend to have a blaze or a star on the nose and uh, kind of Roman nose. So that's kind of what makes them distinctive and they're kind of the most picturesque, bucolic kind of image of working horses that we have. Um, the second, second one on the right there is the Clydesdale, which um, is native to or developed really in um, the Valley of the Clyde in Scotland. 
Um, and they're distinctive really because they've got long legs compared to the other draft horses. That's their most notable feature. They've got very long, comparatively longer legs. Some of these back legs can get ridiculously enormous. Um, I was stood one, next to one a few weeks ago that was kind of almost up to my head, the back withers. And a, it's quite something to be stood next to a leg of a living animal that's nearly the size of you. Um, so they do have big, big bone. They are big boned animals. The one at the bottom there is the um, Suffolk Punch, uh, which remarkably comes from Suffolk. Um, and they were the mainstay of the farming workhorses in the East Anglia for um, hundreds of years. Uh, we've also got, um, oh sorry, so today, as well, in addition to these native breeds, um, the, the continental equivalents are used as commonly, or almost more commonly now, in terms of showing and working. So when I say the continental equivalents, they're kind of the heavy horse breeds that are evolved on the continent. So those tend to be things like the Ardennes, um, uh, Percherons, uh, Belgians, um, Comtois, um, and Frisians as well. So they're kind of um, the, the heavy horse equivalents that evolved on the continent at the same time as these. We've also got a number of lighter breeds in the UK, um, and these are often crosses of our smaller native ponies from Welsh to um, Dales and Gypsy cobs, um, and also crosses with Dartmoor or Exmoor ponies or those equivalents. So what we use at Chag Food, we've got, um, this is Samson, he's a Dartmoor crossed with a Welsh cob, um, so he's um, from a Dartmoor mare crossed with a, a Welsh Section D stallion, and he's bred on the south of the moor down near Ivy Bridge. Um, I've, I've got a lot to say about the, the benefits of native breeds as opposed to heavy breeds, <coughs> but one from a horse management point of view, one of the biggest benefits of using a native breed is really their hardiness. It's an intrinsic quality that makes for a good workhorse. Um, Samson, this, he's got his summer coat on at the moment, but in the winter um, he puts on a big heavy coat, and those of you who saw him last week probably know that he was losing it at the time. So um, what, what that means is he was born out on the moor, he's evolved, um, he's had you know, millennia, millennia of... Um, his genetics have evolved on Dartmoor, um, so he's kind of evolved to the climate, a wet, harsh, maritime climate. So what it means, he can live out in all weathers and he doesn't need to be stabled, um, and he's quite happy living out in all weather. He's, well, he's got natural insulation for it. Another notable factor about the native breeds is the, the feet. Um, Samson's feet are very small, and you can see here he's walking in between a very narrow ridge. Um, and the other thing is they're very hard. Um, you tend to get very hard feet on native ponies, and that means he doesn't need to be shod. So that's an added um, saving, really. Um, the heavy horse breeds tend to need to be shod every six weeks or so, and that can cost about £60 a time, so that's quite a, a cost in terms of a working farm. So having to not shoe the horse really saves a lot of time and effort and kind of bother for the horse because you know, they don't like... Well, it's, you know, it saves, saves them being tied up to have their, their feet played around with. I do trim his feet just with um, a rasp and a, um, a frog knife just to cut out the inside. But, um, yeah, every kind of six, seven weeks or so, and that only takes a couple of minutes each time. So for the kind of work we do, um, inter-row cultivation on the market garden, um, Samson is ideally suited, so like I say, because of his, his small feet. Also, you tend to find with a native breed, um, because they're bred in this country, they're kind of where they want to be, and because of that, they tend to have quite a mellow temperament. Um, it seems quite a generalisation, but you do tend to find with a native breed that they do tend to be very mellow, um, they're very they're relatively easier, less fiery to break in. Um, and that, from me, from my point of view, is one of the best qualities in a working horse, is something that you can trust and, and rely on, you don't have to worry about, and um, you can just relax around it. So that's one of a big quality as well. So I've been asked to talk really about how I got into farming with horses, because um, it's something I feel passionate about, but also to kind of show that you don't need to be particularly horsey to get into it, anyone can have a go. Um, I was never particularly horsey, or even slightly horsey, for all my life. Um, I just happened to grow, grow up in a part of Devon that feels like it's in the 19th century. So um, when, when we decided to start the market, market garden, it seemed natural to me that I'd like to learn to farm with horses. So um, I had no previous experience. I'd never, you know, had hardly, barely ridden a horse or done much work with one. Um, but I did manage to persuade one of the most experienced horse farmers in the country to take me on as an apprentice for a year. Um, and that's Jonathan Water. He's based in North Devon. Um, and within a few weeks of starting that process, this was about five years ago when we were kind of setting up the market garden. Um, and within a couple of weeks of starting with Jonathan, I was walking on the moor up near Whittacombe um, and stumbled across Samson. He was in a field, they, would, they had just bought them in off the moor actually, he was in a field with another 20 geldings. Um, and I whistled, uh, there was like loads of them, I whistled. He was the only one that didn't look up, he kind of had his head in a gorse bush, he was just munching a gorse bush, so I thought he seemed like quite a mellow horse. Mm -hmm. So I um, went and asked the farmer if she would like to sell him. And, um, yeah, she sold him for, I bought him for about £120, I think, but he was completely green. He was just straight off the moor, so that's kind of the price you'd expect to pay for a horse that's had no work done to it. And I then took him up to um, Jonathan and trained him in alongside me, really. So we both 
kind of learnt together. Um, so as I was learning from Jonathan, Jonathan helped me break Samson in, um, and he was up there for about eight, nine months. Um, and then eventually we brought him back to Chagford, at Chagford, our market garden, and got him put into work straight away, harrowing our, our recently ploughed field for our first year's cultivation. Um, so Jonathan's based in North Devon, where he farms 90 acres with six Shire horses. Um, this is me on the harrows in my first couple of weeks there, working, working down a field. Um, <coughs> It's, Jonathan's really good like that. He'll just throw you in and um, he just tells you to get on with it. And that's yeah, a, a quite a good way to learn. You kind of have to learn, really. Um, so he farms 90 acres with six shy horses and he also makes a living breaking in horses for other people. That's a large part of what he does. Um, so he breaks in about 50 horses a year. He has four horses at a time there for four weeks at a time. So every month he's breaking in four horses. Um, in starting out working with horses, you really can't underestimate the time it takes um, to become confident or to the importance, I think I should say, of becoming confident and developing the skills to handle a workhorse safely. Um, I think that is the key to becoming a good horseman is to spend time around someone who's got experience and to pick up on their experience and, and learn how they respond to the horse in different situations. Um, so because Jonathan has all these horses going through, he has, you know, I'd say 50 horses a year from tiny Shetlands right through to 19-hand Clydesdales. <coughs> I got to see in a very intensive period within, you know, sort of um, 9, 10, 12 months, how he responded to the horses, especially, you know, to how to get them to do something they didn't want to do, um, how to calm them down and reassure them when they're scared, um, how, to, um, how to tell when they're being stubborn, which is quite a useful um, thing to tell, uh, and also importantly, how to, what to do when something goes wrong. Um, we did have one incident um, not long after I started where we had a runaway on a cart. Um, I was with Bobby, um, this horse on the end here, um, <clears throat> who was in a cart with another, um, he was about a 19 and a half hand um, shire that was in for breaking. And we were just walking down the road, um, just coming back towards the farm, it was on a sloping downhill. And um, suddenly the horse that we were breaking in on, on the left, he stopped, looked into the hedge where there were some cows in the hedge and shot his, his ears went straight up. And Jonathan just turned to me and said, hold on, he's going to go. And um, sure enough, within a couple of seconds, he bolted. Um, not only with the cart and Jonathan but, and me, but also with Bobby pulling Bobby along. You know, once they go, they really go. Um, and he shot off, you know, downhill, running as fast as he could. Um, he hit a bank, and luckily both me and Jonathan fell off, but didn't hurt ourselves. But he went, he took, he took Bobby and the cart straight up over the top of this bank and down the other side, and ended up tied up in a fence. That's the only thing that stopped them. It does sound dramatic, but to be honest, that for me, that was probably one of the most um, pivotal experiences in my time with Jonathan because. When you're, work, when you're learning training as a, a teamster or a horseman, you're always got in your back in mind the worst case scenario. And that is the worst case scenario to be in a runaway with a car and not know what to do. So for me to have gone through that with Jonathan, it does seem funny to say that, but it, it did give me an enormous amount of confidence because I did see the worst that could happen. Um, and that, you know, even in that situation, there's, there's positives that you can take out of it. Jonathan's very um, clever actually with his, with his horsemanship in that he uses these horses. These horses are in constant work on his farm. Um, and as a result, they're, they're bomb-proof horses, they're solid. That's what a horse needs. They need work, um, and they need to be mentally and physically stimulated um, and respected. And Jonathan's very good at doing that. They're all completely trustworthy horses. And as a result, he can use those horses to train new horses. So what he'll do when a fresh horse comes in is put it into a, a pole cart alongside the new horse. Um, and um, you can see it's quite dramatic, actually, within you know, minutes of this horse coming out, a horse that is potentially green, completely green, that's had a harness on it for the first time, that's completely scared and skittish, will come out and stand next to one of Jonathan's shires and suddenly it will realise that it doesn't need to be scared and it will look up to the shire and realise that it can learn and um, yeah. just accept that it can be calm. And um, So yeah, Jonathan uses the horses very well in that respect in terms of dealing with horses that are un unnerved or uneasy. Um, so although they're relatively domesticated, um, horses, you, you always have to have in the back of your mind that they are flight animals. And they will, it's then their instinct to run away if things, um, things go wrong, if they feel unnerved or uneasy. Um, and to be honest, strapping them into a car, into a harness, and then into a cart or a piece of metal or a farm implement is really asking for trouble, unless the horse trusts you implicitly. And when you get to that point where the horse does trust you, it's a remarkable relationship because you realise that the horse is doing something that's completely contrary to its instinct, but it's doing it because it trusts you. Um, because it wants to, it's willing to work. So it's quite, um, that's the, for me, that's one of the most rewarding aspects of working with a horse. Um, so after a year with Jonathan, um, we took, like I say, we took Samson back uh, down to um, Chagfood, down at Chagford. 
Um, and then we went over to France, where we heard about Promata, um, a peasant farming cooperative in the south of France, who um, developed a, a modern light tillage tool, um, which is based on a traditional paysan peasant farming system or peasant farming tools. Um, I don't know if anyone can speak French here. I can't, but um, we, we know all these names in English. Um, <laughs> um, so as you can see, it's, um, it's designed, it's, it is based um, roughly on the traditional peasant kit in that it's, um, it's utilitarian, it's versatile, it's, um, it's relatively light, um, but also it can be fixed easily. That's one of the biggest assets of the Cassine is that it can be fixed. If anything goes wrong, it's very basic engineering. You can fix it yourself. Um, one of the biggest benefits of it, what they've done, um, Promata has kind of modernised it using lightweight aluminium frame um, and modern tillage tools. Um, and a, um, a attachment is kind of a, a toolbar attachment. So what you can essentially do, it's a toolbar carrier. You can fit up to seven or eight different attachments onto the casino. And what that means in terms of a commercial market garden is you tend to save time because a lot of the... Um, a lot of the time taken up with working with horses is changing implements and up until recently every time you wanted to go from a plough to a harrow to, to discs or to an interrow cultivator you would have to go off and um, unharness the horses and put a new tool on. With a casine what you can do is leave the horse attached to the regulator at the front and simply unhook the tool from the back and slot in a new tool. So that really makes, um, makes for efficient horsemanship, efficient working. And also, it's ergonomic. That's one of the biggest benefits of the casino. It's ergonomic. It's got this handle at the top. Some people had a go on it last week with it. Um, and what it, <coughs> it means is you can work with a straight back. Um, and you tend to find these photos, that, or that picture I had of first up, uh, was of a farmer back in the 20s bent over double over a plough. Um, and it was very rough work. And you tend to find a lot of horsemen would have really bad back trouble by the time they were 30 or 40. Um, so this, again, is a, a good way of kind of ensuring longevity of working horsemen. Um, so over the past three years, we've experimented with the casine <coughs> um, and adapted it to a UK climate. Um, I'll go into a bit more detail on the cultivation method in a minute. Um, but um, one of the most obvious benefits um, of using not only the casine, but generally using um, horse-drawn tillage tools compared to tractorization is reducing compaction on the soil. Um, it's kind of accepted that a healthy soil is really the foundation for healthy crops um, and healthy people. Um, and one of the best ways of maintaining a healthy soil is a healthy population of soil microbes. And what you tend to find with um, farms that have a lot of tractorization or mechanization is that the compaction reduces the amount of air in the soil, reduces those gaps where the air can get into. And as a result, you kind of, you lose your populations of microbes and it's kind of a, a steady slope then going down. To, you, um, you stop recycling so much organic matter um, and then before long you, you can end up with a, um, an anaerobic or podsolized soil. So really that is um, maintaining an aerated soil and a healthy population of soil microbes from our point of view is uh, what we're mostly trying to achieve with using working horses in terms of reducing the compaction um, and looking after the soil. The casine is designed around a traditional payasan system of ridging. Um, I got my dad to draw this up last night because um, it wasn't really, we didn't demonstrate it that well last week. Unfortunately, the conditions weren't perfect to, to show how, the, how it's meant to work. <clears throat> but ideally, in the first stage here on the top left, this is um, the first, first action you would do with the casine, basically, from a pasture field. You go through what's called a scuffle hoe, which is just simply um, a hoe with three goose, goose feet. I don't know if people know what a goose foot hoe is, but it's just um, a very simple um, chiselling action really on the soil. But basically, the idea is that, of that is that you're paring off the top layer of the turf um, to a very shallow depth, really as shallow as possible. All you want to do is pare off the, the pasture and the roots underneath and then leave the, um, the top um, of the topsoil exposed. Um, and once you've done that, it might take two or three passes, depending on the conditions. If it's dry, you should be able to do it in one or two passes, really. Um, moving on from that, the next thing you do is go through with the discs. Um, I should flip back to the first photo we had of Samson. You see the discs. So these discs here, they're kind of con concave discs um, that get dragged along forwards through the soil. And the idea with them is that they pick up the soil and throw it up into a ridge. And they work really effectively when the conditions are right, when it's dry, they work well. So once you go through with the discs, so you're looking down the ridge really that way, um, you kind of make, a, make up a, a rough um, ridge of all of this um, uh, scarified organic matter. And then you do a second pass with what's called a subsoiler, which is simply a, um, a single blade. And the blade goes right through the, um, the soil, only to a depth of about four inches at most, either side of the ridge. And what you're doing with that action, really, is um, letting the air and the water get down into this bit here. But you're also loosening up the soil, either side on the shoulder, the kind of shoulder of the ridge here. 
and then as an, an additional pass with the discs, the idea of that then is that you pick up this loose soil and throw it up on top of this row of um, undecomposed organic matter. So essentially what you're creating is a, a windrow, a long compost heap. Um, so that's the kind of the, the theory of it, that you, you create this long compost heap. And then ideally you have two weeks of dry weather. Um, and <laughs> and um, if you do get two weeks of dry weather, it works phenomenally well in that um, what you have is you have this loose soil covering up any leaves, any leaves from the, from the grass. Um, so all of that organic matter is cocooned underneath a layer of soil. And it warms up quickly because if you imagine a flat field, the sun's kind of coming down and bounces off. If you've got ridges, that increases the surface area. So actually it acts to encourage the, um, the sun to heat up the soil. So through leaving it in a ridge like this, it's actually a really good way of um, speeding up the aerobic um, decomposition process. And if you do have two weeks of dry weather, you can then pass through with the subsoil again right through the centre of each ridge um, to leave a kind of... Um, just a, a gouge through the centre. And then you, you do another pass with your discs. So the idea is, it might not be that easy to understand, but you can move these, these wheels into the middle. You have your discs separated on the outside. So both the horse and the wheels run down the centre here with the discs um, spread out behind. And what they're then doing is splitting these two ridges and throwing them into a brand new ridge. Um, and that's kind of doing two things. It's getting oxygen in um, and reoxygenating the decomposition process. But it's also dealing with the weeds very effectively. Um, what you'll find after leaving that ridge for two weeks, um, you won't get much weeds coming out the sides of the ridge, but where there's um, the dew settles down in the furrow here, um, you'll tend to find you'll get a lot of weeds regrowing in the furrow. So you've got high weed burden here, but right here, where this has been underground for two, three weeks under a warm decomposing conditions, you have a very low weed burden. So what you're doing is moving the soil from an area of low weed burden on top of an area of high weed burden and then you end up with a new ridge. If you do that a couple of times, ideally three times in April, May, um, then by mid-May you should have a very clean <coughs> field that's um, cultivated in this way, uh, weed-free, and with um, a nice rich organic matter that you can then plant your crops into. The Pramata system for planting <laughs> depends really on planting on top of the ridges, and this is kind of one of the biggest drawbacks we've found with, with the system. So in the south of France, they recommend um, planting all of your seedlings or direct sowing right into the top of one of these ridges after you've got it to this stage. And um, it does make a lot of sense in that this is a very rich, well aerated, um, very nice, loose structured soil, um, and the seedlings do tend to like it. They get on well growing in it. Um, but obviously after a couple of weeks, what you'll find is that the, um, the weeds will start growing on the side of the ridge, so then it'll be time to weed. So with weeding, you, do, you basically do this system again, this, um, go through with the subsoil on either side of the ridge, you loosen up this soil, you take out the weeds that are in the, in the furrow, and then you go through with the discs again, and it's exactly the same principle. What you're doing is picking up this loose soil, throwing it on top of these weed seedlings, and basically drowning, drowning those weed seedlings. So, um, and it does work very effectively when it works and when the conditions are right, when it's dry. Um, you can go through one of these ridges, and um, after one pass, you'll have it, you, you're very, it's very um, possible to direct the soil so that it comes up just to the, the base of your, your crop. So you're drowning all of the weed seedling apart from where your crop's going on top of the ridge. That's the principle. Um, <laughs> we found in, um, in this country, we just don't get the weather, we don't get the dry weather in the spring to be able to do it. So what we did in our second year was compromised. Um, we, we did all of our cultivation like this, but because we weren't getting the dry periods to, cut, um, to decompose this organic matter, we were having to bring on just a pedestrian rotavator to go through the furrows and just chop up these, the size of these ridges and then re-ridge them. And that was really just to save time because we're a commercial market garden. We have to get the crop in in a certain time. So um, that was just a, a commercial decision we had to make that we had to bring the rotavator on in, in order to, to fill the boxes. Um, another benefit I'll just mention of the, um, the splitting the ridges, um, what you can also do at this stage um, that Primata recommend uh, for heavy feeding crops like the leeks or cucurbits, um, they'll go down with a barrow of manure or compost and lay it in this furrow down the ridge. And when you throw that over the top, then what you've got is a ridge here, which you're about to plant into with a nice vein of rich organic matter, um, ideally watered, you'd go down with a watering or a hose or something and water it and keep it well watered. So what that means is when these roots develop and get down into this point here in the second stage of the growth cycle, they'll have a massive rich reservoir of well-rotted well fertility to, to feed on and get them growing. And it's actually a really effective way of um, manuring uh, a crop because um, you're not spreading manure where the crop's not going, you're spreading manure exactly where it's going. So it's quite an effective way of using limited manure or compost if you've got it. 
Um, in the same regard, I show you our potatoes, planting potatoes using the ridges. Um, exactly the same principle. You've made your ridges on the side. You just walk down the furrow, dropping your potatoes every foot. And then Samson will walk over the top of here with the casine going over the top of the, um, the potatoes. And then the discs will fold the soil in on top behind them. So it's quite an effective way of doing your potato ridges as well. So like I say, we've experimented with the casine <laughs> over about three years. And we kind of adapted the... The, the system to, to make it fit uh, with our way of farming, uh, which is kind of what we've had to do as a, as a commercial unit. We've also, I'll just mention, we've, uh, one other adaptation we've done is, um, you'll notice if there's any growers in the room, it's quite thirsty on space to be feeding, to, to give um, one crop on a ridge. These ridges are about 60 centimetres wide. So to have just one crop growing on 60 centimetres um, does seem like a bit of a waste of space, especially when it's something like leeks or carrots or parsnips or salad crops. So what we, because we were, trying to, we were trying to do in the first year we got this, we were doing 25 boxes on one acre, so we were trying to get as many crops in as possible. And the same, you know, we've had to be quite conservative on space. A system we developed was to, instead of just growing on top of one ridge, is to get to this stage and then fold these ridges in on each other, so fold two ridges into one bed. So instead of having two 60 centimetre ridges, we end up with a 120 centimetre bed. Um, that's raised at the size and then has a flat top and this nice fine tilt is on the flat top and we can then direct sow using an earthway um, or um, hand sow or put transplants out onto that. Um, I've built a springtime cultivator that will fit onto the casine with the same attachment that we can then weed those beds with. Um, so it's worth pointing out with a casine it is ideally suited to market gardens up to three acres. Um, up until last year we were on three acres so it worked out well. We were kind of getting to grips with the casino. It was kind of working well with our system. But we've just taken on another um, three acres um, on a new site. So we were aware we had to find another method. We, we were aware the casino was going to be, we were going to be stretched to use the casino to do all of the weeding, all of the cultivation on the new site. So about a year and a half ago, we looked around and we found this, <laughs> um, which is um, the Pioneer Homesteader, um, made by the Amish in the States. Um, and it's uh, mm. it? yeah, it's been prototyped. It's um, it's robust. It's functional. It's elegant, as you'd expect from the Amish. Um, it's been prototyped for over ten years. Um, they've got in, in the states. There's about three and a half thousand people farming with horses. So they've got a big reservoir of practical farmers to try out new tools on. Um, so they've, like I say, they've been prototyping this, and now it is a really well refined finished product. It only went on sale last January. Um, so we managed to buy the first one. We actually got the first one in Europe. I don't know if there's any more over here yet. But, um, and it's one of the biggest benefits about it is it's designed for halfling sized horses. So the same kind of size as ours, kind of 12, um, 12 to 14 hand horses. It's not really designed for big, heavy draft animals. So it really, really suits our system well. Um, similar to the casine, it's a, it's a toolbar carrier with a very simple attachment system for attaching these different tools. Um, it's got six tools that come with it. Um, this tool here has been invaluable. The last three weeks we've been using the disc harrows for working up ground. Um, it's remarkable. The, the quality of the tilt you can get this is like going through with a, um, a rotavator on the back of a tractor. Um, you know, with a couple of passes with the discs, they do a fantastic job of um, turning in muck and also disking up a tilt um, for you then to make your seed bed from. From our point of view, one of the most <coughs> exciting uses of the, the homesteader is as a steerage hoe. Um, so the idea is you're making your beds with this hilling tool. You make your beds within the wheels, um, so you, we, you can make a one metre bed, um, and then the horses walk in the path on either side of the bed, and the wheels then straddle the bed for all your further operations. And when you put this tool on, the cultivator, onto the homesteader, there's two locking nuts you can undo and two foot pedals. Um, so you can basically be sat right above your crop, with your crop you know, inches below your feet, using a steerage hoe to steer the wheels within a couple of centimetres for precision weeding of the crop. Um, we've tried this out, it's worked. it has worked well, but we haven't got any crops to try it on yet, so we're quite excited to wait, <laughs> wait until we get the crops in. Um, but potentially this will revolutionise the efficiency of our weeding. You know, in, the, in the last three years we've been spending hours and hours and hours hand weeding, hand hoeing um, our beds when, when it's been too wet to, get the, um, to, to weed with the casino. So hopefully if we, get, if we can do a bed in you know, sort of 15, 20 minutes with, with the homesteader, that will really maximise the efficiency of the, the, the market garden. Um, we've also recently, um, oh sorry, so the homesteader is ideally suited for market gardens of 5 to 20 acres, that's kind of what they marked it at the Amish, they kind of designed it on that scale. So for us it's perfect, it will kind of see us through, hopefully we, we're not going to go up to 20 acres, but um, yeah, that will, yeah, it's perfect for the scale that we're on. And we've got the new field we've taken on, it's got nice long rows, um, 
100 meter rows. So again, that kind of lends itself to a, a horse tillage tool like this. I just want to show you this inspiring photo from. Oh no, sorry, that's us with. Sorry, this is um, uh, this yeah, this is our new horse. It's a two-horse cultivator, obviously. So we trained up. This is a uh, Tally. He's a Welsh cob horse who we trained up to work alongside Samson. So this was us last autumn when we had just got the homesteader trying it out for the first time, actually. So they're working really well as a pair together, and that's some that's an additional kind of quality to working horsemen. Ship really is working with, with two horses as opposed to one. You kind of really um, see that team ethic building within two horses working together. They kind of really uh, air each other on. It's fantastic to see. This is the inspiring photo. This is, um, unfortunately, this isn't the UK. This is, um, <laughs> this is Pennsylvania. Um, this is a farm called Beach Grove Farm um, run by Eric and Anne Nordell um, in Pennsylvania. Farmed um, entirely with working horses. Um, it's a 20-acre CSA. Um, and probably might, maybe the first thing you might notice is the, um, the efficiency of space they're using there. If this was a tractorized system, which is kind of the alternative that you would use on that scale, you'd have a lot of space between these crops for the tramways for the tractor to go through. Whereas with, because the homesteader has got, and it's farmed, it's not farmed with the homesteader, but it's a similar tool, but the homesteader's got very narrow wheels and horses, like I say, can walk in between, you know, sort of down to 20, 30 centimeter paths. And because of that, you are able to maximize the amount of crop you can get in your area, less bare ground, and um, in terms of soil management, it's good not to have too much bare ground because then you don't have so much erosion. So this really I included because it's a fantastic photo. And it's just a kind of inspiration of what can be achieved, you know, with the right setup, with the right horses, with the right mentality and approach to working horses on in market gardens. Um, it's a very well tilled, well managed, very economically efficient and um, successful market garden. So it's, for me, it's quite quite a good good thing to to inspire. You. Um, we quite often get asked why we're using horses. Um, from my point of view, the main, my main reason, motivation for using working horses is about the skills, the knowledge and skills, traditional farming knowledge and skills, which I feel need to be kept alive. I think, as I was saying, there's only 20 um, people farming with horses in the UK, and most of those are in their 50s, 60s and 70s. Um, and when those die out, those people die out, then that, will, that knowledge is going to be lost. And I think it is really important that young farmers kind of take responsibility for keeping those skills alive. Um, and it's really only through you know, youngsters like us getting on and getting out there and doing it that those skills will be not only kept alive, but also developed and evolved for the next generation. And um, I do believe that working horses will have a role to play um, as we need to reduce the amount of oil we're using in farming. So that's, that's something to, to bear in mind as well. Um, <coughs> Again, we use them yeah, for um, the soil, soil health and fertility as well. That's another of the main reasons we use them. Um, we also get asked uh, if this way of farming is um, competitive or can compete with a tractor in terms of efficiency, uh, with the argument that um, it's qu it would be quicker um, and therefore cheaper to use a tractor for the same tillage tasks. Um, I'd probably agree it would be quicker and cheaper, um, but, uh, but there's an added quality to working with horses that you really don't get from working with a tractor. I've spent a long time working on farms with tractors um, and it really doesn't, <laughs> it doesn't really fulfill me as much going and sitting in a tractor, working on a tractor, as working with a live, intelligent, um, responsive animal. Um, so for me, it's kind of about a quality of work and I think if you're going to spend all of your time working on a farm, then anything that um, increases that quality of life and that quality of work is a bonus um, that you can't really put a price on. So it's very hard for me to, to justify it economically, but it's more of an intrinsic value that I, I attach to working with horses. Um, in terms of time, time, however, I would say the casein is limited in that you can only work one, one row of crops at a time with it. Um, but then um, with the homesteader that we just used, uh, we're just importing, um, it, it's based very much on the Massey Ferguson um, or the Massey toolbar system, which many of these market gardens would be alternatively set up on. So you're working one bed with several crops on at one time. The benefit over a Massey Ferguson system is that when you're sat in a tractor weeding row crops, they're always behind you and you're constantly looking around, crooking your neck. Um, and it's very easy to make mistakes with tillage um, and cultivation with a tractor compared to with a homesteader where you're sat right above the crop or even with the casein where you're walking right next to your crop and it, you're able to stop and start very easily. Um, you have a lot more precision, a lot more control over the weeding operations. Uh, in terms of capital costs, um, a solid trained workhorse will cost you anything from 1,000 to 3,000 pounds, depending on age, temperament, breeding, uh, and experience. Um, and the casein and a harness for a single horse would co cost you about 2,500 um, to bring over from France. Um, the homesteader, 
slightly more. Um, remarkably, the homestead actually costs almost exactly the same as the Cassine uh, in the States, but bringing it over here costs the same again. So actually to bring it over here. Uh, so if you're looking to bring a homesteader over with two sets of harness um, for, for the workhorses, it would be more like six grand. So that's quite, a, quite an investment. But having said that, that's kind of the price you'd expect to pay for a, a good Massey Ferguson 135 today. So, so it is comparable. In terms of running costs, however, um, Samson cost me about £30 a year in feed. Um, in oats, I feed him oats when he's working. Um, so yeah, for two of them now, that's gone up to £60, which isn't a massive um, outlay. Like I say, no costs on shoeing. Um, I do all of the trimming myself. Um, and because they're hardy native breeds, they don't get ill. I've, you know, Samson's six now, um, and I've only had the vet out for him once, um, and that's when he had a cut on his leg. But um, you know, other than that, in six years, not having the vet out is quite, you know, quite good for a working animal that's working every week on the, on the farm. Um, and it's that, that is, uh, in my opinion, that's kind of down to the native, um, native breeding and the fact that he's living where he wants to be, the fact that he's living where he's evolved to be. So that, that kind of is an added benefit. How much grazing do they um, Because he's native, he'll graze out on the moor. Uh, we, we have turned them out on the moor on commons before. But uh, over the year, we, on, with two of them, over the past year, we've rotated them um, effectively on about four acres uh, for the whole year. For two horses. We have got a much larger field that we can use, but we've only been kind of restricted that to about four acres of grazing. Um, so yeah, in terms of yearly costs, running costs, to achieve the similar with a Massey Ferguson tractor, you'd be looking at at least, we kind of worked out about £200 in red diesel for the tillage operations that we do, and that's before insurance um, and maintenance. So I think that's pretty, oh, I've got the last slide uh, to show you, you're never too young to start. This is, um, <laughs> This is Eric and Anne Nordell's daughter, actually. She's two years old, um, driving a team of Belgians um, in the States. So just to show that you can, you can start young. I'm going to get my boy out there before long. <laughs>